Hello everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to all Physio TV viewers. I, Dr. Rucha Rai, Assistant Professor from Sancheti College of Physiotherapy, Pune, welcome you all to today's webinar on long haulers in COVID-19 by our renowned speaker and alumna, Dr. Darshika Parikh, a physiotherapist at Rehabilitation Hospital of KT, Texas. Before we begin with the session, I would like to introduce our panelist for the day. Today we have with us Dr. Rajni Pagare, Professor, Deccan Education Society's Brijlal Jindal College of Physiotherapy, Pune. UG and PG from Cardiorespiratory Physiotherapy from LTMMC and Zion Hospital, Mumbai. Ma'am has 22 years of experience in the field and 14 years of teaching experience. Clinical experience in intensive care physiotherapy and cardiac rehabilitation and she has several paper publications to her credit. We are pleased to have you with us today, ma'am. I welcome you. Thank you, Rucha. Uh, our speaker for today is Dr. Darshika Parikh. Uh, she has done her bachelor's from uh, MUHS India, as well as master's in cardiorespiratory physiotherapy from Sancheti College of Physiotherapy, Pune. Uh, she has completed her doctor in phys physical therapy from University of Montana. She has immense working experience at various setups uh, in Texas including Concept Rehab Incorporated, AMN Healthcare, Houston, Texas, etc. Uh, she has worked in acute care settings to develop physiotherapy treatment plans for patients of a variety of conditions. And she currently practices as an outpatient physical therapist at Rehabilitation Hospital of KT since 2017. Uh, we are pleased to have you with us today. Uh, today, ma'am will be giving us information about long haulers in COVID-19. I request Dr. Parikh to kindly begin with the session. Okay, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. I'm happy to be here. Let me start sharing my screen. All right, I'm Dashika, and uh, I've been a physical therapist for a long time now, but I bet nothing compared to what Rajni Mem and Rosia Mem's experience stands. Um, sorry, this is not clicking. Please bear with me. There you go. Right, we're going to be looking at long haulers today. About me, I've been PT for 14 years. I did my bachelor's and graduated in 2007 from Paramedical Institute and master's in summer 2010 by Centrity Institute. I specialize in cardiac vascular and respiratory sciences. I recently graduated from, in spring 2021 for my doctor's of physical therapy through University of Montana. I have experience of working in four big cities, Mumbai, Pune, Troy, which is part of Dayton in Ohio, and now Houston. I have worked in a acute care skilled nursing facility in patient rehab, and currently I have my, found my home in outpatient rehab. I've been working at my current location since 2017 as an outpatient physical therapist. I have been LSVT certified for Parkinson's program since 2016. And I'm neuro certified, neuro FRA certified for stroke and brain injury since 2019. I have no financial interest. None of my patient information has been shared, so no HIPAA violation. I'm not an author of the, any of the materials being presented in this webinar, and I do not own any published materials. I've simply put together my experience. The objectives that I have for y'all today is to get a brief overview of pathophysiology and long haulers. I'm sure we have tons of pathophysiology and details about COVID since it all started, but I'm just going to try to keep it brief. Identifying the dysfunction that leads to long hauler, implementing appropriate rehab strategies, and developing skilled outpatient rehab guidelines for your setting. So, COVID 19 pandemic. It has affected worldwide and population of almost every age. The virus spreads through close contact and droplet transmission, as we all know, and people who have had pre-existing conditions are likely to have more fatal and severe outcomes. Currently, we're seeing this Delta variant being prevalent in India. The total number of cases as of the statistics I found on the morning of June 11th, 2021, were 29.3 million cases. Of course, I rounded them up of total COVID cases in India so far, and 27, uh, 27 million have recovered. Total death toll has been 363K. This number is going to change in the next any moment, any hour. They keep updating it. 
mild cases are not requiring hospitalization, as we all know, sometimes even moderate cases, but they are recommended to have isolation. The goal of hospitalization is just to bring down the viral load and stop the catastrophe from happening, which is hypoxia, hypercoagulable stage. The best prevention is mass social distancing, hand washing, and of course now the vaccination. And of course, the memes that goes throughout the social media. I have had been subjected and forwarded through WhatsApp, through Facebook, thousands of things that can keep you away from so coronavirus contamination. Do they really work? Gotta try. A study done by Mandel et al. in 2020, in which they had, it was an observational study, they followed 384 patients post discharge from their acute care. And they found that on a median of 54 days post-discharge, which is about two months post-discharge, more than 50% had breathlessness, more than 34% had cough, 69, like that number is scary to me, 69% had fatigue, and 47% had depression. And they had the people who had elevated biomarkers, especially came out with the worsening of their diagnostics, like their radiographs, their CAT scans, trying to tell us that their pathology is pretty extensive and just the health condition keeps declining if it's not attended the right way. Prolonged sign and symptoms comes because of the residual lung fibrosis, diffuse alveolar damage, capillary and, and extensive endothelial damage. The fatigue and dyspnea can persist and usually does 30 days post discharge, even on those people who are not going to be long haulers. The quality of life is reduced in about 40% of the patients that recover from COVID. ICU acquired weakness, the statistics are also quite staggering. We also see dystoneuropathy, skin breakdown, metabolism alteration, and many, many more symptoms. What is long COVID? You're done with it, but you're not done with it. Patient who has had suffered from COVID-19, of course. Long COVID is the people who are having the onset of new symptoms or they are seeing the lingering continued presentation of the symptoms four to eight weeks after their negative PCR test or their recovery or discharge from hospital. It is to be expected to some extent in patients who have had a bit hospitalized with kind of more rocky corona, like post-intensive care syndrome or a critical illness myopathies or deconditioning or debility diagnosis. However, a patient who have had mild hospitalization on observation with oxygen or they were kept in home observation with oxygen have also reported cluster of symptoms way past their COVID recovery. This can include fatigue, which is, I think, the most commonest presentation I've encountered, breathing difficulties, exercise intolerance, headache, nausea, brain fog, which is the second most common thing I've encountered, cognitive limitation, anxiety, depression, third most common for me, muscle pain, dizziness, fever, and again, there are tons of more that are probably am not listed here, but we'll see them later on. Now, I see decoding for COVID. It took them a while. Of course, so far I know that till mid-June, they were kind of labeling COVID infection in the hospital as other viral abnormalities. Like we didn't have an IC code for COVID-19. Of course, the process takes very long to develop the code. Now for the long haulers, I think the projection is either of these two names are gonna get picked up like post-acute sequel of SARS-CoV-19, like PASC or chronic COVID syndrome, which is CCS or long COVID, which is like we fondly call it as, but we don't know which one's gonna stick, but either this, this diagnosis is what you're gonna see in next few months. About 10 to 13% of the hospitalized patients are expected to be long haulers. And these statistics come from different studies. And um, some people have reported 10, some people 30, but I, in reality, I expect the number to be more because most of the studies, they're projecting these people who were out of the hospital. People who have had moderate COVID, who were isolated at home and who recovered, we don't have statistics on them, at least not that I was able to find. So this number could be more higher than what has been projected. A study was done by Ludwigsen in 2021, which is again, an observational study, and it had a very small sample size of about five to seven. 
and it was done for the school kids, the age 12 onwards. And they reported similar symptoms of COVID, the long haul or symptoms of COVID in these kids and the ability to return to their schooling long after their recovery, as long as four months after their recovery. So we are dealing with a lot. And as I reported here, as of today morning, the numbers in India for recovered COVID cases were 27 point million. Imagine even just 10% of the 27 million. We're looking at about 2.7 million people probably suffering through chronic COVID and long, being a long hauler. So let me go back to where we were. Another study that I would like to pay your attention to is by Demond in 2021. This is probably one of the most important study to me because it is first study that was oriented to its PT outcome, like cardiopulmonary exercise tolerance, what they had studied in patients six months past their recovery. And what they came out to with is that patients have persistent symptoms, are being out of breath, fatigue, are most prevalent symptoms. And the recommendation is that they should be offered a tailored rehabilitation intervention, which include muscle reconditioning, breathing retraining, and respiratory muscle strengthening. At acute stage, you see any of these symptoms. And again, this has been repeated in literature thousands of times. I will not go ahead and bore you with that, but the list is right there. And if I've forgotten something, I'm sure you all know it. Long COVID, sorry about the image clarity, but tons of symptoms. And again, I'm not sure that these are enough. There's more. There is more that we don't know. There is more that has been reported and has not been connected to it. And there is more that we're speculating that we haven't confirmed that. But if you see joint pain, fever, cough, dizziness, chest pain, uh, tinnitus, loss of smell, breathlessness, muscle pain, pins and needles, neuropathies, headache, fatigue, dizziness, and sleep disturbances, COVID toes, nausea, the list is really big. Every system in the body is affected the nervous system, cardiac system, vascular, pulmonary, renal, neuromuscular, integumentary. The COVID toes is actually a thing. I actually did see a patient with COVID toes and it's, it's very discouraging to see this kind of outcomes in people who are completely recovered. They feel like they've been the battle. They have survived the, um, the most difficult part of their life that they have survived the pandemic. And they are like, we're still not there yet. How big of the long of the road is for us? Looking at the symptoms progression, week one and two where you are symptomatic after contracting the virus, then in the acute stage, you're seeing a lot of symptoms. The viral load is higher. And then once you fall into the post acute stage, you see how many symptoms are being popped up. They can go as high as six months. You're seeing fatigue, muscle pain, weakness, decline, dyspnea, set up in saturation, anxiety, sleep disturbances, cognitive disturbances, palpitation, DVT, pulmonary embolism due to thromboembolism, kidney failure, hair loss, which is, but yes, we see them. Why? Well, COVID is merciless. It doesn't leave any of your body system unaffected. What you're seeing is basically every part of the body being affected by it endothelium, which is the, the backbone of the, all the vasculature of the body gets affected with the inflammation. The ACE receptor COVID spikes, likes to stick on the ACE receptor and that's how the cascade starts. The imbalance can cause a severe vasoconstriction and of course that could alter the blood flow mechanism and can cause severe organ damage. Death of the host cells can cause organ damage. Hyperinflammatory response of interleukins is definitely going to cause a cascade of problems. Platelet aggregation, and especially I would like you to pay attention to this mega karyocytes. They have been projected as probably one of the biggest pathology behind why we're seeing the neurological implications of COVID, what we're seeing. Neutrophilial, extracellular traps, the coagulation, this is again a very Constraining mechanism, the, it leads to the disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, fibrinolysis, and literally shut down, causing fatal outcome in critically ill patients. 
autopsies of COVID patients have revealed the direct viral load present within the myocardium, microvascular injury, acute coronary syndromes, and of course, declining in cardiomyopathies in the later stage. So let's just speculate a little bit about the brain fog. Why? Why do we see it? There are more purpose mechanisms for brain fog that we know. Different authors have different opinion. It's probably the hypoxia to the brain during the acute stage. It's probably the vascular injury causing metabolism shift, the stroke, of course, ICU psychosis, viral encephalitis, post-viral inflammatory syndrome. It could all be reason of the brain fog. However, to me, this one was quite a surprise. Mega curious sites. To all you to people who don't know what this is, they are the bone marrow cells. They're not supposed to be in the brain, they're supposed to be in the bone. The cytokine inflammation storm, the storm that releases the cascade of destruction, has somehow linked with release of the cells, and the cells cross the blood brain barrier and have found in the autopsies of patients who have had severe COVID in their brain. And the literal description was given as a football being stuffed into the pipe that size of a golf ball. So they are stuffing up all the capillaries and vasculature within the brain, leading to consistent and persistent neurological symptoms. Could it be a neurocovid? Yes. Study done by Frontier and et al. in 2021, they studied the extensive neurological aspect, the CNS affection of COVID-19. And all of these patients who had neurological symptoms who were affected with COVID-19, over 90% of them, they studied, they found they had abnormal outcome. 50% had cognitive limitations, activity of daily limitation, Again, 62%, quite a big number, anxiety, depression, and fatigue, sleep disturbances. 47% were not able to return to their previous level of function, not being really able to return to work. That is a scary number. This is a proposed mechanism. Again, I would like to point out that a variety of pathologies can cause the capillary obstruction, reduction of the blood flow, irreversible or reversible cell damage, which can cause to all these symptoms, especially the brain fog. And brain fog is very, very real. Being said that, like I also treat a lot of vestibular patients and post-concussion patient is some the population that I love to work with. Work with concussion patients, and I like to throw them a scale of a concussion symptom inventory. And these on the left, you see are the symptoms reported on that scale that's related to concussion. On the right are the symptoms that has been reported in literature for COVID, post-COVID and long haulers. How many of them are similar? More than 80% have a headache, you have fatigue and sleep disturbances, you have autonomic dysfunction, exercise intolerance, dizziness, Cognitive limitations, memory limitations, mood effect, anxiety, depression, weakness. I haven't found a photo in light sensitivity yet in post-COVID, but definitely being out of breath, weak conditioning. So I do see that there is a lot of similarities. That aspect explains a lot about the neuro aspect of COVID infection. It's all coming from here, but it's affecting everything that's there within the body function. I feel like I've said it all, but what's next? We know now what's causing it. How do we handle this? That's what we do best. We kind of bring rehabilitation into the picture and we help these folks get back to their normal. So who's candidate for our patient program? Patient with a history of COVID-19, of course, they may or may not have been hospitalized. We're actually trying to spread more awareness for the flyers through anything we can to let the people know that even though they have not been hospitalized, if they're suffering from the symptoms, we can help them through the rehab. People who are reporting the limitation with their brain fog, inability to work or school or neurological symptoms, activity limitation, exercise intolerance, any and everything, sleep disturbances, balance problems, anxiety, fatigue, patient, <clears throat> sorry, who have been on home health before, 
it was theoretically fragile. And now they're improving six months later, they're, they're like moving a little bit there and wanting to come to outpatient to get improving their functionality. They're all candidate for this program. Let's see what we're gonna see in these patients. We're gonna do some consideration about their evaluations. History, of course. You're gonna have a detailed history about their COVID infection. You're going to get the idea of their current symptoms, what is still limiting, not what they had. What was their prior level of function? I was working in a grocery store. I used to be on my feet for eight hours a day. I was stacking and unstacking the boxes, but now, I stand for five minutes at the countertop and wash my dishes and I'm done for two hours. I can't move a muscle after that. That's not a good sign. That's the severity of the fatigue I've seen in folks. Days in the hospital, days on mechanical ventilator, days in ICU, of course, it has a direct correlation with the other comorbidities that comes with it, like the diagnosis of post-intensive care syndrome, ICU psychosis, ICU acquired weakness, debility, deconditioning, so that's gonna just gear your mindset towards evaluating those function, functions and patients. Post-intubation complications, I would like you to pay attention to words there because they may have swallowing dysfunctions, not being able to eat well or aspirating silently or not being able to have a good phonation secondary to intubation complication requires a speech referral. Identifying the potential neuropsych referral, these people definitely have anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder kind of presentation. What if I get COVID again? You want me to come to an outpatient rehab? Your outpatient department is full. What if I'm going to catch something here? I don't want to go through that again that I did. That amount of anxiety. I can't drink my water in front of you. I have to lower my mask. I don't want to do it. I'm afraid of catching it again. They are very, very scared. They have cognitive limitation for which I would highly encourage a sleep, sleep language pathologist and OT referral, a multidisciplinary approach. What else are you gonna review? This is for you so that you, get, you can connect the clinical presentation with the underlying pathophysiology and you can predict the prognosis. The pulmonary lung function test, uh, of course, the spirometry, you're gonna look at the decreased lung volumes, decreased diffusion capacity and any other function that you can interpret, or you can definitely go by the impression that's given by pulmonologist on the report if you, if you aren't able to interpret the charts, but get an idea of what the projected lung volume should be and what the current lung volumes are, and you will get an idea of how much reduced they are. And there is, again, a good amount of literature available online, which will tell you that patients who are not able to generate certain amount of tidal volume would have a certain amount of functional capacity, so you can very well correlate to what their current status is and why you're seeing the decline the way it is. I would also go through their echo report just to make sure that we have accurate cardiac function and ejection fraction is something I worry about and any evidence of myocarditis, cardiomyopathy that we want to be aware, pulmonary hypertension, we want to be aware about MRI and CAT scan. Of course, you want to go through any radiological investigations that you have in your hand to see what part of the brains are affected. If you're still seeing patches of inflammation, if you're seeing strokes, or you have a CAT scan of the lung showing ground glass opacities and the signs of residual inflammation. Chief complaints and review of symptoms as per the usual hierarchy of assessment, we go to what's bothering them the most. These are most likely gonna be complaints, again, this may not be it. They may come up with something else that is not on the list, but definitely these are the most common ones. Fatigue, I would still rank it as the number one clinical presentation for me. Shortness of breath with activities, pain, maybe sleep disturbances, most likely. I uh, Some of my patients just report to me like, oh, I'm functioning fine. I just, when I get tired, I take a nap and that's it and I'm fine. How many naps do you take in a day? Oh, maybe about four, like 20, uh, 20 minutes to two hours, and I'm fine. Have you, you go back to work? Are you going to be able to take a nap? No, but I'm working fine. I just have to take a nap. No, that's not a good sign. They are making up for their fatigue by taking a nap. That is not a good sign. That needs to be further implored. They need to be educated. Their daily routine needs to be modified. Their activity education needs to happen, pacing, 
ADL modification. There's a lot that goes on with it that needs to be attended to. So please ask in details about what do they do when they get tired? What is their strategy? Do they go past the lockdown? They just lay down and forget about the world until they're ready to wake up again? If they have to go out for an event, like if they have to go out to meet a friend, how long does it take them to prepare that? Like I have to plan my entire day around it. Will I be able to entertain any outing? No, because I have to plan because I get tired. That's a very big sign of activity limitations. They are not back to themselves. They're changing their daily routine, their activities to accommodate their symptoms. That's your biggest clue. Impaired balance coordination is one of them. I'll explain in detail why. And vision changes, that's kind of odd, but I have seen it happen. Increased GI reflex, again, I'm gonna get back to that later on, but main brain fog, memory loss, dizziness, hair loss is again, one weird one, but skin changes, you're all to be blamed to the mirror COVID sequel that I explained earlier. Swallowing dysfunction, probably related to the post integration complications and loss of taste and smell. We don't know why it happens. Just to throw it out there, since these patients are known to have coagulopathies and they have been in hypercoagulable stage, at least some of them, during their hospital stay, I would have you keep in mind a light screening about their DVT risk and pulmonary embolism risk. I use the Wells criteria, again, well established within the literature, and that's a very good clinical prediction rule to rule in or rule out the presence of deep vein thrombosis. You have to score each extremity. If the patient has bilateral swelling, I would have you score each extremity separately and to identify the separate risk for DVTs. You are going to score them and this is what it indicates. This is not a, a for sure result. People with low risk, like less than 3% risk of having a deep vein thrombosis have found to have an actual DVT. And sometimes people on high risk have been had negative DVT on the Doppler test. However, should you see a clinical presentation and the patient fits into Wells criteria with their total score more than three, it is a good rule to refer them to your physician to rule out a DVT or to a Doppler on them. So this could be life-threatening if they escalate pretty well. Most of, the, most of the patients are asymptomatic with DVT. The home and sign is practically non-existent in some of the DVTs that I have encountered, but I would be very vigilant about their coagulation status. If they are on anticoagulant, if they are adhering to their medication regime, they're following what they've been told. If they have been not moving as much as they were supposed to because of the fatigue or other factors, keep in mind, you need to just be aware at the back of their, your mind about this potential risk. And again, this is the best criteria for pulmonary embolism. So if the patient has had DVT or they present with any of the clinical signs, again, you're gonna score them. And this shows the mean probability of having a pulmonary embolism. What do we do in assessment? We went through the history, we went we ruled out the red flags like DVT or any other red flags that you would rule out like resting dyspnea or anything else. But uh, other thing that I would like you to go through is a thorough assessment of what you see. When I bring them in my clinic, when you go to the evaluation, you just like walk towards it and watch them walk, just passively assess how they're breathing, how they're coordinating breathing with walking, they're using assisted device, how tired do they get from walking, just coming into the clinic. Well, we're fortunate or unfortunate in a way because our clinic is like in the back of a little building, so they have to walk 100 feet. Or if they're too low level, they'll be transported in the wheelchair, but they have to walk at least 100 feet. So by the time they come in, and they just sit down and do their paperwork. And I'm like, hey, I'm the sheet, I'm the OPT. I'll be doing your evaluation, follow me. And they are like, I just sit down, give me a minute. I can't do it now. And then you kind of get an idea of what functionality you're dealing with. But the passive observation is going to be more um, informative to you. And you can gauge what they look like, what their breathing posture is, what breathing pattern are they following? Are they like tripoding? just to get your breath, you're using accessory muscle respirations a lot. And if you suspect cough, I encourage you to auscultate. Even if you see a little shallow breaths, I encourage you to auscultate to make sure you're not seeing or dealing with atelectasis or you're not dealing with productive cough. 
we have um, kind of a moderate to severe inclination towards believing that the patient who have had been neg negatively tested on PCR test after their acute discharge are less likely to spread virus through coughing. However, I would discourage that coughing at any cost because again, you want to be as preventative as you can in your clinic. If they do have coughing, you want to take them to the area where there's a less patient population and make sure you're wearing your mask, you're wearing your gears, and you're being careful about all the precautions that you need to take. And of course, current supplemental oxygen need. The RP scale is your best friend in gauging this patient's activity tolerance. Like, it's of course a very good idea to assess their vitals, but what they feel is very important. Again, we'll know that why pretty soon. These are my outcome measure recommendations and the outcome measure that have been highlighted in red are the APT recommendations. Fatigue scale. I do have an electronic medical record system. The EMR has a lot of outcome measures embedded in it. So I don't have to get a printout of anything that uh, sometimes we do a little printout version of scales that we need a quick thing if some people are not computer friendly, they like to go old school paper, paper and pen eval. So print out some fatigue scales in your clinic. That would be helpful to get a quick assessment on these guys. Uh, brief fatigue inventory, modified fatigue impact scale, fatigue severity scales are really good ones and they're very easily available on Google or any other rehab uh, measure space. Strength testing, uh, I personally like to do five times at the stand, the quality of the stance that is a good indicator of the proximal muscle strength. If they're using data proximity, what is the height of the chair? Usually recommended 16 to 18 inches. Or you can alternately do 30 seconds set to stance, how many transitions they can score within 30 seconds. The APT recommended MRC sum scale, which is again a very simple scale. You are asking the patient to perform an active range of motion of a three muscle grip from the upper extremity and three muscle grip from the lower, deltoid, biceps, and wrist extensors, hip flexors, quadriceps, and ankle dorsiflexors. So you're going to scale them on the zero to five scale of her manual muscle strength testing scale. You're going to scale them 30 out of 30 because you're seeing uh, five, six muscles and five gradings. So the total score could be 30 for one extremity and the whole body score could be 60. And it's just very simple and easy way to scale. For the balance testing, I do works balance, depend if they are using a SESTO device. If they are not using a SESTO device, sometimes it's still a pretty good scale to do. 10 meter walk test, and this is an excellent test. It's so simple. The administrative burden is extremely low. You put up a distance of 10 meters, tell the patient to walk at their normal speed, and then again, measure the fastest possible speed that they can produce. There is a good amount of literature support for this test. It takes less than 20 seconds to implement, depending upon the gait speed, of course. But the patients whose gait speed is less than 0.4 meters per second, they are very limited. They're probably household or non-ambulators. Gait speed between 0.4 to 0.8 meters per second, have been a limited household emulator status, and the patient who has had a gait speed more than 0.8 meters per second have had at least community ambulatory status. Again, the patients who have had a gait speed more than 0.4.6 meters per second has have been reported in literature to have multiple hospitalizations. Patient whose gait speed has been less than 0.2 has been have given a mean survival rate of five years. Excellent scale, like super easy to implement, good clinical correlation. Timed up and go, functional gait analysis, is this is for the folks who report dizziness and balance impairment, more gait dynamic balance impairment. Activity balance specific confidence scale, this is a subjective report of what you feel confident about doing and not doing. APT recommends short performance physical battery, again, a very good skill. It has a components of um, standing balance, uh, posture control, and part of the gait. So it's kind of a combination of a bar, part of the works, part of the 10 meter work test, and part of the FGA. So it's, if you're done familiar with these skills, this is a pretty easy skill to implement. Endurance test, two minute walk test, six minute walk test, and two meter step test. So two meter step test is just you stand a patient next to a wall, draw a line between their ASIS and their patella, 
midway through that line, you mark, put a marker on and you tell the patients to march, bringing their knees as high as the marker between in the, uh, at the midpoint of their thigh. And how many of the marching they can do within two minutes, you wanna record the number of the times the right leg actually marches to the mark. And you wanna record that would be their score. And of course, you're gonna correlate it with their functionality and that would be your outcome. Core strength, abdominal strength, diaphragm mobility, strength and endurance. Of course, you can get through it. Um, the PI Max device, I believe none of us have it. It's mostly in the research institute and in the, not in the clinical setting, of course. So it's a little difficult to get an idea, but just like a simple cheat sheet, we get the incentive spirometers. So I would just have you gauge their ability to handle the incentive spirometer. Again, I've seen patients do very awkward stuff on incentive spirometers. So there are some kinds that have the little disc that goes up and down. Someone has like one, two, three balls that goes up and down. And then I tell them to show me how they do it. And this is what I see. And I'm like, no, this is not, it's, this is not the way we're supposed to do. It's supposed to encourage the correct breathing pattern, discourage the use of accessory muscles. So assess what they're doing. Are you doing incentive spirometer? Yes, my PT told me to do it in the hospital. My nurse told me, my doctor told me, and I've been doing it every day. Show me how you're doing it. And this is what you get to see. Is this benefiting? No, that, that education is vital. The correction of the posture is vital. And of course, screen for DVT, assess for spinal range of motion and limitation, thoracic and cervical spine alignment has a great role in predicting your lung functions. So definitely you want to assess that. Quality of life, promise, global 10 square, super easy scale. It's available, uh, it's free. EQ, 5D, 5L, I believe it's a paid scale. So your institute needs to pay for it to access it. What's the big deal about diaphragm? Why is it so important? Of course, it's a primary muscle inspiration. It's a core stabilizer. And a little known, it's an anti-reflux muscle. People who have had diaphragmatic dysfunction will report some kind of GI reflux issue. They don't know why it's causing it, but yes, you know why it's causing it. The diaphragm is the very important muscle in your body. Um, actually, let me walk you through the di diagram itself. Um, diaphragm weakness comes from the mechanical ventilation, increased work of breathing, posture mobility, deconditioning in the ICU, uh, altered breathing pattern, altered intrathoracic abdominal, forces, and of course, diaphragm weakness can cause the alteration on these forces, which can alter the distal limb force and overall reduce aerobic capacity. Let's understand why. So Miss Mary Mastery, she's a very well-renowned physical therapist, and she has proposed this model of Sonocop can to explain the diaphragm dysfunction. I took her permission, I reached out to her, I have attended many of her courses, and they have been amazing. If you get to attend any of them, please do it. It's very nice the way she explains everything. And um, this is a soda pop can model. So uh, in her research, which she published in 2005 about the pathophysiology, uh, actually I have the title right here, Musculoskeletal and Neuromuscular Interventions of Physical Therapy Approach to Cystic Fibrosis. So in this article, she explains why children with cystic fibrosis have impairment in their skeleton and which in turn worsens their outcome. So she has theorized that a soda pop can, a closed, unopened soda pop can represents our intrathoracic and intra-abdominal cavity. The diaphragm is right in the middle. The vocal cords represents the opening, the pelvic floor represents the bottom. According to this paper, every muscle in this area has a dual role postural stabilizer, and as a breather. When it comes to choosing the role between posture and breathing, the breathing will always be favored because that's your necessity. However, if there is a dysfunction in this little mechanism, you're going to see the results in form of alteration into the abdominal or intrathoracic pressure, which could in turn come out as altered GI mobility, constipation, or it could come out in the way of pelvic floor weakness. So in her pub paper, she reported that 
women with cystic fibrosis have more urinary incontinence than the normal women in the studies that they have reported because any alteration in the strength and function of this cavity, this muscle groups, is going to stress out the weakest link. Your vocal cords and your pelvic floor are the weakest link, the weakest outlet, and you could have a major dysfunction right there. Lack of abdominal strength can cause urinary incontinence. I bet all the pregnant women can attest to that. At one point in time, they have suffered from that. When you're pregnant, your abdominal strength is practically not poor and how many of them suffer from urinary urgency and incontinence and sometimes even after that that's why postnatal rehab is so vital we are regaining the control which we lost the intraabdominal pressure is vital for vascular manifestations your blood flow regulation of the core pressure which in turn is responsible for your hip function and your blistal lymph force production so I'm going to give you a simple task. Like if you all can just try it briefly, you don't have to, you can try it later, right? But I'm going to give you a simple task. You all can just try standing on one leg and see how long you can hold it. Preferably try on a non-dominant leg. You can time it. And then I would have you repeat this test with the posterior pelvic tilt. Suck that tummy in really, really strong. Keep breathing, don't hold your breath though and see if your quality of hold improves, if your time improves, if your ease of holding the single leg stance improves. That's the reflection of core pressures into improving the proximal force production. Your hip needs the lumbar spine and the core to be stable to function. If your hip is not stable, you're going to see the weakness pursue into gait, into balance, and again, the lumbar spine weakness is gonna project more on the hip, hip and it's gonna create more pain and aches. Again, she's also put forward a research or I don't know if she's an ongoing project or a, a research that she's intended to do where she's trying to assess the balance problems in patients with vocal cord problems. Because again, remember, this is a cavity. This is an outlet. If this outlet is broken, so post-intubation complications, vocal cord dysfunction, do we expect balance problems? Potentially, because that's an outlet to this cavity, and every muscle has a role in maintaining the pressures. So compare this picture where you see the crushed can. If the can is open, the can is closed, the strong carbonation pressure inside can maintain the pressure of the can. You can't crush it. But what happens once the can is open? There's a weak link. You can easily crush the can. Same way excessive positive pressure, excessive coughing, or weakness in your posture, forehead, kyphotic posture, you're going to have difficulty breathing. You're not going to be able to maintain your pressures adequately. Your cough will be impaired. Your secretions will be retained. Your breathing pattern will be affected. Your posture, your balance will be affected because the muscle needs optimal length tension relationship to function. Is it an optimal picture? No. So you're going to see that impairment. Hence, it is very important to relate to the posture, to the diaphragm function, and see that all the muscles can function the way they should they can in order to optimize your outcome. Please have a, it's a really good record home. So assess posture, of course. Upper cross syndrome, this tripoding. They've been used to breathing heavy. They've been just like using their hands on the chair, bend forward, forward bending, and leaving the dyspnea. That could cause organ postural alteration, favoring the accessory muscles of respiration rather than the usual diaphragm. Hypertrophy of the accessory muscles, kyphosis, lumbar and spinal thoracic alignment, forward head posture, scoliosis. Again, scoliosis is something I would not expect to be a result of it being a bed down, but again, it could actually at least create a functional scoliosis. Just a picture of what I went through. This is a classic posture of a person with the um, upper cross syndrome that you would see. And potentially, look at your pit, close attention to your long collar. This is the resting posture, then you have a lot of work to do. And this is, again, an important intervention that I would like you to assess, autonomic dysfunction. Pusher orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or and dysautonomia. This is what you're trying to seek out in the patients who reports fatigue as their primary problem. 
definitely assess for this. You're going to find abnormal results. Viral response in, to the position change will be altered. It may not be classifiable into either POTS or any other category, but it will be abnormal. How do you find that out? Through active scan test. I'm gonna explain it to you in just the next slide. When you perform this active scan test, they may complain of headache, nausea, vomiting, sweating, wet cramps, palpitations, and shortness of breath. What is active scan test? So you take your blood pressure, heart rate, lay, have them lay down in supine and take it after five minutes of laying down in supine, ask the patient to stand up on their own, take the vitals three minutes after standing. We all know that with position change, there is going to be a vitals change. We're going to see the blood pressure fluctuate. We're going to see a heart rate rise to keep up the blood flow from cooling, and then it's going to normalize. Orthostatic hypotension is more than 20 millimeter HG systolic fall into the blood pressure and more than diastolic, uh, 10 millimeter HG diastolic fall after standing for three minutes, not right after for three minutes. If these patients do not have a blood pressure fall, they, don't have, they are not hypotensive, but instead they have a heart rate jump, then you can classify them as a postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. But they have a criteria. You have to have a heart rate of 30 beats per minute or more when they're standing for more than 30 seconds right after standing, or 40 beats per minute or more in the age of um, young age people after 12 years. This is a very common sign I see in post-concussion patient. This is the primary reason why they're exercise intolerant. And this is, again, one of the big reasons why I believe neuro-COVID exists because I have had this kind of people and believe me, they make up the most chunk of my post-COVID people. I had a person and who on assessment reported severe fatigue and I assessed her. I just had her stand. Every bit of standing, every minute we stood, her heart rate kept going from every five to 10 minutes up and up and up. Like baseline heart rate was 80. And standing after four minutes, the heart rate jumped to 129. It went to 130. She started sweating. She had a headache. She was having a little blurriness of the vision. She felt palpitation. And at the end of eight minutes, she collapsed. Her RPE went from three while sitting to 11 out of 10. That's also what she reported. But 11 out of 10, she was very tired by just standing for eight minutes. That's the kind of abnormal response. And this person, this kind of a population showing this vital response cannot possibly rehabilitate back into normalcy. Standing wears them out. Imagine doing their daily travel, their commute, their work, taking care of their family. They're not gonna be able to handle that. Really screen for this. Again, there's a, in a reference, I mentioned a couple of articles regarding this. Please have a read. They explain this phenomenon in post-COVID patients. It's, it's a very interesting read. Occupational therapy outcome measures. We have an OT team on board, and these are the recommendations. Um, of course, you may have more uh, outcomes by yourselves that your OT team can recommend. And uh, state language pathologist outcome measure, of course, in addition to the swallowing dysfunction, if they have, they would do the modified barium swallow test, but they would be doing this cognitive test and the slumps is one of the recommendations from APT. And it's pretty simple, actually, even the VPTs can implement that. Are we there yet? Not yet. <laughs> Treatment considerations. This is what an ideal COVID rehab clinic should look like. You would have a pulmonologist, you would have a neuroscience to deal with the anxiety, depression, a primary care to provide the education, a kidney injury person, hematology, and everybody, a full-blown rehab team. So when you are starting, what would you want to start with? You have a patient come in with the COVID, post-COVID long, Polar history and you did their assessment, you found that they have so-and-so limitation, they're complaining of fatigue, dyspnea, exertion, activity intolerance, and any variety of the symptoms. Where do I start? What do I do? Start with simple breathing. Your diaphragm has a dual role. It is a core stabilizer. It is a breathing muscle. When you are doing the rehab of this diaphragm, you need to make sure you're rehabbing it for both roles. You can't just possibly rehab it for breathing. 
you do the diaphragmatic breathing and when they start walking, you're walking like this. That's not acceptable. They have to be able to share the diaphragm in both the roles. You encourage them, you progress them to diaphragmatic breathing in the most comfortable position, progress into the sitting, progress into standing, encourage them to maintain the diaphragmatic breathing at all costs. Abdominal rise with breathe in, abdominal shrink with breathe out. This is something I also do, teach effort on exhalation. If these patients have deconditioning myopathies, every time they stand, they move, they're like holding their breath to move just to get that pressure build up so they can move better. You wanna discourage that because they're using the breath hold as a diaphragm stabilizer rather than essentially control of diaphragm through abdominals to control their core pressures better. You wanna, it's kind of a motor relearning for your diaphragm. So you're gonna teach them effort on exhalation as in I tell them they breathe out as you stand up. So you're gonna get them prepped up, one, two, and breathe out and stand up. That's going to incorporate some motor learning. This is something, an easy cueing. They can reproduce that in everyday life. Going stairs up, breathe out and climb up the stairs. You're lifting something off the shelf, breathe out and bring the heavy weight down or heavy weight up. Any activity that requires an effort should have an exhalation. Very easy to teach and very effective. Press lip breathing to control dyspnea, of course. We have all been reading that in our, since our school days and it is still true, it works. And prepare the diaphragm for both the functions, kind of correct use of insert spirometer, of course, because they need to learn that to do it correctly. A little note on acute care. Um, as a PT, we're strong advocates of early mobilization and let's get them moving, move, move, move. However, when we have a little rendezvous with our acute care team, their observation shared and important information to me. They were saying that the patients who were high flow oxygen dependent or they were a little medically fragile, they have seen that aggressive mobilization strategies did not work efficiently. They work the patients out and patient feels like, oh yes, I can do it. I can walk, I can get up, I can move around. I've been sitting at the chair, like a bedside chair for a while and I'm really getting better. And when they come to see the next time, the next day, in fact, their progression is very bad. Like they have defaulted from eight flow of eight liters of oxygen to 16 liters. They have backstep, they're just like trying to breathe. And the person who walked 200 feet yesterday on our acute care floor is just struggling to breathe. And during the lab work, it showed that whenever they were subjected to heavy activities that created the similar cytokine storm, that came with the original infection, and that caused a mass reduction in function. They have had to modify their effort. They had to pace, even though they do not feel symptoms, they pace them. They move the patients like strict warning, do not move again by yourself. And if they tolerate it better, they gradually bring them up on their activity level. But I have not I'm not sure if this is what you guys are seeing in your acute care as well. This is a clinical presentation, but this was the information that they shared from me, from, from their side to me. And uh, it was quite an eye-opener. Like we cannot push aggressive mobilization. We have to spread out acute uh, care OT and PT sessions like at six hours apart at least to have them recover. And acute care treatment sessions are anyways less than 20 to 30 minutes. But even that was intolerable, just seated exercise, bicep curls, LAQs would drop their saturation down. And <clears throat> it would take them a while to come back up. Their discharge date would get pushed and just delay in their outcome. And during my inpatient rehabs, um, inpatient rehab team, when we communicated with them, we also established the need to re-emphasize correct use of breathing techniques. Inpatient rehab aggressively focuses on mobility. So trying to get them up and moving is the goal. Let's go, let's go. You're deconditioning, you're here to work and you're gonna be able to tolerate three hours of rehab every day so you're ready to discharge. So yes, their goal is to get them up and moving, but I, we have talked about it and we very much emphasize using the correct strategy, effort on exhalation, breathing pattern. If you're waking them up, make sure they're not really defaulting to altered breathing pattern. Keep cueing them to breathe right, use their uh, strategies right, maintain their posture. So be really attentive. We go diaphragmatic edu breathing education, uh, personal breathing education right here all the way we follow it into the outpatient to see the repetition and cueing of every therapist to make an effect. 
and changing the patient's perception and they're able to learn to control their symptoms better. These are some of the examples that I have pulled out of uh, breathing exercises that you can implement on the outpatient side. Again, um, I'm sure you can come up with more, but it's just like some easy examples that I was able to find and I put them on. You can inhale, exhale. This provides the cueing. This provides the resistance. You can upgrade the resistance with the tear tubes. This provides the thoracic expansion with rotation and you can incorporate breath holds, lower segmental expansion, thoracic mobility and breathing, PNF patterns, coordinated breathing, of course. Posture correction, facilitate the correct breathing mechanics, but pay attention to the posture. So very simple, you have a person who is forward headed, who is upper cross syndrome, who's been breathing through tripoding, who's been using this a lot, has been complaining of a headache due to the overuse of trapezius and other muscles causing strain on the cervical spine, reporting headache due to subcranial spine impingement, we're seeing a lot of those heavy attention to posture correction, mobilization, posterior chain strengthening, and trigger point release. And I'm about to show you a picture of trigger point release and how do we efficiently do that. And we teach them how to do that. And uh, it really is helpful to them and they feel so good after doing it. So these are just examples of the stretches to improve your thoracic spine mobility, the pec stretch with the thoracic extension, the uh, lat dorsi and intercostal stretch, thoracic extension dips using the Swiss bomb, sternocleidomastoid mastoid stretch, the pec stretch, the again, uh, lat dorsi and uh, thoracic uh, lateral flexion stretch, then uh, trapezius stretch. This is a, the self-release that I was telling you about, the tennis ball release. So we all have, clean, in clinic, we have a lot of tennis balls, and of course, we use them for different reasons, but this is one of the very important reasons. I have taught them how to release the trigger point, the soreness with the tennis ball. So basically, you get the tennis ball, you find the trigger areas, you push, let's say, upper traps, you push the tennis ball right there where they hurt, maintain the static pressure for a few seconds till they're able to sink in and let the inhibition go. They relax. You feel them tensing up, going down, relaxing and you maintain that pressure and have them do active range of motion of that muscle. So for upper traps, I would have them do down and up, and then again, shorten the pressure, hold the hand down on the chair, stretch the muscle, and up, down, all while I maintain the pressure. And again, there are tons of active release techniques on the internet, Google them. They're very efficient. They're teaching videos and anything and everything you can find. But this is very, very good technique. They can control what they can tolerate. So basically I just give them the tennis ball and like go against the wall, go against the mat or go against or have someone do it for you. Or you can use the belt even to stabilize the tennis ball against you. You can identify the sore spot. It doesn't have to be a motor trigger point. It just have to be where you hurt. You try it for like 30 seconds. And if you feel relief, you relaxed the muscle grip. And this is very easy and they can use it, it empowers them. Oh, I'm just sore, I'm having a headache. I can just rub a tennis ball and I feel better. And it actually helps them. Uh, the common muscle groups I tell them to do is liver to scapulae, uh, sub, uh, trapezius, suboccipitals, and pectoralis, leg dorsi, and of course, the rhomboids and lower traps. Some of the posture correction exercises that we use commonly in the clinic, wall angels, chin tucks, thoracic rotations. Uh, if you can notice, there's a little blue bolster right under this lady. So it's kind of, it gives a little edge and uplift against the mat, and then you can promote the thoracic extension and shoulder flexion better. Of course, you can pair breathing with it. You can add resistance with that, like as much as you want to push. And the famous rows, WT, Ys, and Is, you're targeting the uh, rhomboids, the middle traps, the uh, up lower traps, and the upper traps. Wall posture, encourage them to go to the wall, align, and then walk out in that posture, maintain that posture as long as they can to facilitate the correct posture. Fatigue. Again, the way I, the, I told you an assessment to assess for dysautonomia and POTS, that's the primary reason of fatigue. 
Now, what do we do for this fatigue? It's an autonomic dysfunction. Why does it happen? Neurocovid, that could be a possible pathology. Again, it's like very correlated with what I feel is like I see in concussion, I see in neurocovid, it's kind of very similar. So basically, the autonomia and POTS happen because you have autonomic dysregulation of the positional change, your heart rate changes, your blood pressure changes. And the autonomia and POTS is doing the exactly opposite of that. I have seen patients with the standing and walking, their heart rate just goes down to 60. And as soon as they sit down, their heart rate spikes up to 130. So their heart rate, their cardiac output is not matching to what they're supposed to do. They're pushing themselves. I need to walk. I need to get better. They get on the treadmill. They feel miserable. And when they get off, they feel even more worse because now they're having a heart rate of 130 beating through their chest. That's like 50 or 60% of their HR max while they're sitting down. And they have no activity to correspond it to. They're just sitting and resting. This kind of abnormal fluctuations in vitals is a very limiting. And I have seen crazy symptoms with it. When I used to treat patients with dysautonomia, they would do so well in session, like, hey, I was able to walk on the treadmill. And the next time they come in the clinic, I slept for 16 hours. Yes, I did. And that's what happened. I did so well in PT. I went home, I fell asleep, and I just didn't realize I woke up the next day at three o'clock in the afternoon. I just was so tired. It is a very odd response that you get, and it is very difficult to monitor them. So being aggressive, advocate of physical therapy is a good thing, but you need to back off when you see this presentation, when you see autonomic disturbance. You're going to start with core strengthening, in recumbent position, you're going to educate them. Hydration is a very big on these population. I have them carry a bottle of Gatorade or I have them carry a bottle of water or any kind of a drink that I would prefer. I would monitor the vital response, but the RPE is the easiest and biggest clue for me to gauge their tolerance. We start with recumbent exercises, 30 repetitions of SLR, 30 repetitions of long arc cords, two sets, circuit training, we go through the lower extremity, we go to upper extremity, core, repeat, in recumbent. When the vital response is appropriate with recumbent exercise, I do not see the vitals jumping or HR to be precise, jumping more than 10 beats per minute. Then I know, okay, they are tolerating it as well. Then I try to move them to sit up position or a propped up position. And again, have them go through the circuit and see the response. If their heart rate plummets, that's wrong. Move them back in progress. So you're actually going against what you learned and believed in your PT school. You're trying to put them down, get them stronger in that position, see if it translates into the upright position. So I often tell them, I want you to get tired when you're working with me, but I don't want you to feel anything after that when you leave me here. If you're taking naps after you go home, if you're not able to do your daily activities, if you had to alter your day or your plans because you did PT, we overdid it and we step back and we go back to laying down. These patients are super functioning high level. They're not on assisted device. They're walking in the clinic like they're completely fine, a visitor perhaps. But when you make them exercise, their heart rate response is quite worrisome. And just a little side note on that, if they are on beta blockers, go by rate of perceived exertion whose heart rate fluctuation would not be accurate with them being on beta blockers. So be mindful about that. And uh, definitely try more interval and circuit training. Don't go by more repetitions. Definitely try moving through the muscle groups. Isometrics have helped more. So if you're having them do SLR, do SLR with holds. If you're doing long arc holds, that with holds. We do biceps holds with shoulder flexion, incorporate holds, because isometric exercise increases the peripheral vascular resistance, and that in turn helps normalize the blood pressure response a little bit better. Go from down gradually up, provided their vitals are incoherent with the activities you're projecting them to. There are some dysautonomia protocols available. Again, you can view them and see if that's something that you can utilize for them. It cannot be a cookie cutter. It has to be tailor-made for your patient. It's just a little meme. Then things you cannot say a patient with chronic illness and chronic COVID is going to be a chronic illness person. So just a little something to laugh about. Dyspnea, of course, being out of breath is not fun. You have to see what they can handle. And of course, do not let them get more dyspneic while you're in the session. You have to monitor the recovery time, shorter recovery time, of course, the better. 
monitor their vitals, monitor their oxygenation pre and post activity. And we all know that pulse oximeter may not have a true reflection of what their ongoing saturation is. However, that's the best clinical tool we have. Again, I would have you go back to read the perceived exertion. That's a true reflection of what they feel. And what about the diaphragm? We talked a lot about it. The soda popkin model, the diaphragm, the postural control. How do we strengthen the diaphragm? Inspiratory muscle training. Again, very vital. It is going to be very easy to incorporate. It's like an added spirometer that you give out to your patients and you encourage them to do it. You teach them correct way of doing it. Again, you want to make sure you explain the range of motion, the correct movement pattern, the position that they are supposed to, the position progression they're supposed to, the frequency, the intensity, and all of it. What I would have you try is start with 30% of the PI max, or if you don't have a PI max assessment, you just kind of go by an arbitrary setting on the commercially available devices. You start that lowest setting and have them build up to the setting that they can tolerate. You go for two to three minutes or two, you see the brief failure. The range of motion is from residual volume to total lung capacity. So have them breathe out completely and then have them breathe in through the device till their maximum lung capacity or maximum inhalation has reached. Some device do offer a supplemental O2 connection and discourage the accessory use of muscle. If they are getting tired, again, you do not want to see this. You have to emphasize the correct use of the diaphragmatic breathing because again, you're strengthening diaphragm, you're not strengthening their shoulders. This cannot be used alone. It has to be used as an adjunct to the total body conditioning. Just some pictures of commercially available breather trainers. Just to throw out some prescription, exercise prescription considerations, um, assuming your patient is a very low level, they are on high supplemental oxygen, basically their functional capacity is less than three mass. So all they can do is maybe walk a few steps, do some light laundry folding and sitting, maybe watch for TV for a few hours. I mean, they're not doing well. They cannot tolerate more repetitions, more intensity. How do we progress them? Breathing retraining, inspiratory muscle training would be most beneficial because you're improving what's wrong, right? You're trying to work on the breathing and core stabilization at the same time through the muscle training. You're strengthening them out. You're gonna require to give them more rest breaks. And if they're really, really weak, they can't sit up, consider working them in the prone position to improve the basal breathing or sideline position to improve their lower costal breathing. Because that's where you see the most gastric change and that's where you begin to see more lung expansion benefits. Resistance training is ideal for this patient because that gets them less dyspnea. Walking, standing upright is going to get improved, uh, in, increase their fatigue and dyspnea compared to sitting and doing 20 biceps curl. However, I suggest you try the higher resistance first because you're really looking for muscle strengthening. Two pound is probably not going to do a great translation into functionality versus you give them five repetition with 10 pounds. They're not going to like it, they're going to work it, but you will see the improvement in strength. You follow the principles of strength training, high intensity, low repetition. Moderate level, functional capacity, three to five mass. They can probably walk around at like two or three miles an hour on a treadmill for a little bit. They may may not be on the oxygen. These folks are kind of fun per population to work with. They're there, but they're not there. So they need a little bit of push. And this is where all your principle of exercise training will be adequately used. You can incorporate breathing, strengthening, thoracic expansion exercise, and strengthening with the therabands, free weights. You can go from total body exercises, eccentric exercises, squats with the breath holds, uh, squat with the upper extremity load, isometric eccentric combination. You can subject them to elliptical by treadmill training, aquatic swimming, anything that you want to, and work on the aerobic activity tolerance. They may require less rest breaks in the previous category. However, they're gonna likely to show more improvement faster. High level patients, they're there literally, but they're like 10% or 15% away from what they were before. So their functional capacity is definitely higher than five mats. They can walk at like three to four miles an hour for an hour. They're able to tolerate their, they're able to demonstrate their activity tolerance better, but they get a little bit of a snake with climbing upstairs or just walking too fast. 
And the best way to approach these guys is hit high intensity interval training. This is what I do with them. I go take them to the circuit of uh, three minutes or five minutes, uh, depending upon what I think they can handle. Sprint, rest, red, uh, march, rest, heel raises, rest, jumping jacks, rest, then um, lunges, rest, squat holds, rest. So you're targeting them through the upper, lower core circuit with rest, but these all are high intensity activities. And they are gonna be very out of breath, but the recovery time is shorter. And you will see their vital fluctuation is not that bad. These patients are really fun. You can subject them through a lot of high intensity activities and they will recover really fast and they will do better. Alternative adjuncts that they can use. Again, every person has their own belief. Meditation, yoga, tai chi, dry kneeling for pain, acupuncture, nutrition consult, of course. Support groups, believe it or not, they help a lot. You are going through this, I'm going through this, we are all in this together. A psych consult, it helps. It definitely helps, especially neuropsych if you're suspecting neurological consequences of COVID. Neuropsych has an immense importance in relieving the post-traumatic stress disorder related to COVID infection, helping them feel better, getting back to the normal, letting go of their anxiety and fear. Like, what if I get isolated again? What if I get COVID again? Will I be subjected to the same? I will never be able to recuperate. I may not survive. And all that anxiety is paramount. And especially if they've seen a loss of a loved one while they were going through this, it is something that they're not going to recover with just physical therapy. They're going to need some additional support. So consult psych. This is something we all probably know at some level, the information that I presented, but is there anything else? Maybe some of you already know or don't, but here is my suggestion blood flow restriction therapy. So what blood flow restriction therapy means is we're trying to cut off the blood supply of the working muscle, as literally as I can put it. The principle is when you put a near uh, 7 to 8% of total occlusion pressure on a limb, you're forcing those muscles to work in an environment of anaerobic metabolism this releases a high amount of lactic acid that channels the brain into myogenesis, recruiting more muscle group, muscle hypertrophy, and that improves your dystrophic, atrophic deconditioning results. Basically, there are tons of contraindications that you should be watching for, tons of precautions. And if you want to do a presentation, if somebody wants to research and make a presentation out of it, you will need at least an hour to go through what it is. And I possibly cannot sum it up in two minutes, but this is another baby project of mine in the pipeline, and I'm hoping to get certified into this. For upper extremity, the recommendation is 50% of occlusion pressure, and for lower extremity, 70%. You're using low intensity, low to moderate repetition. So you put the pressure cuff on, inflate the pressure, and it's not the standard BP measuring cuff. It's a specialized cuff. So don't just start putting that on and doing it. Please don't. I do not recommend that. And I'm not an author of this treatment. So please refer to the guidelines that the author has recommended. And you try to do the light activities, but you're doing it in such a high anaerobic stress that the muscles are subjected to regenerate or at least send the stimulus to the brain to do more myogenesis. This was one of the very good educational video in PACER series. I believe if you all have seen it, if not, I highly encourage you to go back to it. APTA had put forward a PACER education program in which when the COVID started to provide guidelines and um, uh, how to deal with the COVID rehab. And there is a video, an education series on blood flow restriction therapy. I highly encourage you to watch it. It's very informative. And they have shown that the people who have been subjected to blood pressure, blood flow restriction has lowest and with an ICU, they've just put the pressure on, comatose patient can't do anything, but put the pressure on, inflated the cuff, watch their vitals, make sure they're stable. Two minutes later, deflate the cuff. Just doing this regimen has prevented muscle wasting. It has maintained the quadricep girth in this patient, which you typically see in post-ICU patients, like their quadriceps are this skin, their thighs have scrambled down. You see the skin hanging, muscle mass is lost. However, so the patient who were on this regimen did not do so. Also, it is a very widely used in some of our clinics and they use it primarily for sports and medicine 
Connex, where they use for athletes to have injury recovery and other strategies that goes along with it. But I'm considering you to think about and see if you all can get certified or get some kind of a more education on this to implement this because this is a shortcut. You're literally trying to do nothing. You're doing the SLR, but you're putting the cuff on and you're forcing them to do SLR with uh, uphold, their blood flow uploaded. You're trying to upload the arterial flow, not the venous flow. And you're trying to definitely have them do passive tolerance and then progress towards the active tolerance. And what you're seeing is improve and muscular hypertrophy and muscle strength. So tons of literature, just go out and Google it and you're gonna find a lot of information about it. And this could be a pretty vital and easy shortcut way to strengthen your post-COVID folks without having to subject them through the excessive strength training. The side effect of repeating the excessive strength training is muscle tears, sprains, aches, Sometimes the little set muscle soreness, and sometimes you have excess of reactive oxygen species, especially with eccentric ones. Like I, sometimes you make them do 10 squats, like, hey, I did it, I'm fine. And when they go home, they fall into the casket of, I just came out of the day, I've been so sore. What did you do to me? I did not want to come back to the clinic today. So this is very beneficial in that area that the damage from this has not been as extensive as a pure strength training with it actually releases harmful reactive oxygen species, the ROS, we want to call it. But um, this training is, is really uh, something you need to venture on. There are some apps that you can give your patients to help them with their fatigue, their uh, daily core chores. I mean, I'm not sure if all these are available back in India, but um, you can definitely update your resources depending upon what you see back there. HEB2GO, all the pictures that I presented in the webinar today were from this website. It's an excellent resource. It has some uh, free uh, options where you can just Google, uh, like search for any exercise. You can put it out in a little collection and then print it out and give it to your patient. You can edit the frequency, intensity, and that will be a good something that you can do out to your patient. If you're an institute, you can definitely pay for it. It's just very cheap, like $5 per month or something. And they offer Google translation, so you can actually translate into any language to give it out to your patients. So the, the, that way you have an easy way of communicating with what you want the patient to do. This is the website for Pacer series. Go through all the videos, tons of information out there. And this is the website for rehab measures, any kind of functional outcome measures that you're looking for, any functional test, uh, any physical therapy or occupational or speech therapy related outcome measure, you can find the database on this, which has all the psychometric properties, minimal detectable clinical change, anything and everything you want for it, it's on it. And there are some other resources too. These are my references. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too long. Thank you so much. Um, that was a very informative session. I'm pretty sure our viewers learned a lot. Uh, I request uh, Rajni ma'am to kindly begin with the question. Yes. Thank you, Rucha. Um, thank you, uh, Darshika. It was a very lucid presentation and uh, it was a combination of your experience and recent advances. Uh, you uh, went uh, meticulously through the information of pathophysiology and then uh, we, you have explained the cascades of uh, functional impairments which is uh, seen in COVID-19. And uh, also you focused on evaluation, the outcome measures. Uh, um, um, and um, there was a beautiful illustration of uh, diaphragm uh, dysfunction showing the uh, can, uh, Coke can. And uh, I could see your love. <laughs> I could see your love for core. So uh, you went into the details of, of core and uh, you have given examples that how um, 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 uh, how it will cause a difference when you um, treat your core. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that was really a very good presentation. And also you have put some insights um, in the treatment strategies like in acute setup. Um, uh, there should, you shouldn't go very fast a slow monitored mobilization 
will uh, play a key role in uh, treatment of COVID-19. And um, another uh, very uh, different and new technique which you have uh, focused about, that is blood flow restriction therapy, which was really new for us. Thank you very much, Darshika. I have a few couple of questions for you. Um, sure. uh, I just want to uh, know that how challenging it is to rehabilitate a patient with mental fog or cognitive impairment. A lot. A lot. I have, um, again, I don't want to, I want to cross HIPAA, but let me just put it that Mr. X has been my patient post-COVID and um, I has, his primary job was in a field of finance. So all numbers. And post-COVID, he looks fine. He walks around fine. He sounds fine. When I work with him, uh, what did you do today? Oh, nothing. I've been just trying to get back to my accounting and I just, I, I just can't seem to focus. I forgot what this word is called when you put up a log and you put up the numbers in it and he has been in accounting for at least 40 years and financing and he can't remember the simple day-to-day -day language of his job and he can't recall. Every time he talks to me about what he did in a day, I have to fill up his words. Oh, I went there. Uh, your daughter's house? No. Your friend? No your church? No. Oh, yes. I went to my church and this happened. Simple recall has affected. I don't believe short term memory, but they can't think fast like they did before. The quick decision making is gone. They are there, but they can't seem to bring it out. There has been disconnect between what they want to say and what they want to, what they are feeling. They have been very, very impaired by what they want to communicate. And definitely their sentence, the conversation, which could be a two minute conversation ends up being 20 because they just can't find the right word and they keep looping themselves into a different story. And also they're, they're repetitive. They repeat the information to me. Did I tell you this is what happened to my friend when I was telling him about this? I'm like, yes, we discussed this last session. Oh, okay, then you all know about it. Well, anyway, I would like to tell you again either spite of me telling him that I know it <laughs> and he still goes through that. So they have had the combination and cluster of symptoms, again, very similar to concussion that I see the young athletes who come to me after concussion or anybody post-concussion who would have hit their head and just can't place anything. They're like in a brain fog. I'm reading this book, but I just can't remember what I read. And I was an avid reader. I don't know what happened. I can't place it. I just can't focus. I can't concentrate. So these are the problems that I'm seeing. And I just straight and refer to speech. Like, hey, you need a speech about, and speech language pathologists can do their job and they do beautifully, I should mention, in getting some of the strategies and empowering them to maintain whatever they need to do. They also go through the maze test and driving control test and see if they're able to drive because you can't drive, you can't find directions. You don't remember which street to turn into you run on the wrong side of the freeway, you're gonna be in a big crash and that's not what we want. So that that has been an implement part and like we have to have a multidisciplinary approach, it cannot be a one man team. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, uh, apart from stroke, uh, have you seen any other COVID, neuro COVID um, uh, mm -hmm. diseases? Like uh, uh -huh. we have seen GBS like syndrome and also neuromyalgia. So uh, have you been come across with such things in the US? Yes, yes. I have had read a couple of studies about GBS and I actually did have one person with GBS with coincidental GBS with COVID hospitalization. We don't know if it was COVID that led to it, but again, it's all speculation. And there was a study in the literature which reported that the, the, since the neuropathy that happened, they couldn't probably write it as GPS, but acute demyelinating neuropathy that led to the death of the five candidates that they studied, I believe it was in Spain, that, um, that has documented that this kind of a viral consequences has had happened. I only had one person who had a coincidental GBS with the presentation, but not much. But this is what I've seen more than neuro COVID, the brain fog, the dysautonomia, that has been my cream layer of post-COVID population. Uh, do kids also come with COVID, post-COVID syndrome? Actually, we do not see them at my location because mine is adult only. So we do not have patient population okay. under 16 at my location. Oh. So if they do, they get referred to the pediatric location. So we haven't, I, I haven't at least. One last question. Um, 
uh, we see a loss of smell and a loss of taste in uh, covid patients so have you come across with a long uh, standing loss of smell and loss of taste and do you all refer them to olfactory training not really because uh, we don't know why it happens and mm-hmm. any kind of a sensory loss is something i would say there is no trajectory of timeline when you can recover it like even after stroke can you recover sensory aspect god only knows mm-hmm. i don't know for sure so i do not believe there's anything that we can do for that at least not for pt and that's something it's not skilled or billable unit for us and the referring them out to the neurologist is not something they're going to attend to it's more like you're rehabbing and loss of taste and smell is something I cannot rehab for you. So it's not something, no. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. That's all, Darshina. <laughs> Darshika, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank it you. It was great having you guys. Thank you so much for being, letting me be on this platform. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parikh, for the enlightening session on long sure. followers in COVID-19. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been facing COVID-19 for quite some time now and the information that you provided us with, I'm sure it definitely helped our viewers. Um, I liked at the beginning how you said you're done with it, but you're not really done with it. <laughs> we still have a long way to go and, you know, um, we don't know how, for how long it's going to last. But I thank you for guiding our viewers and it was lovely having you with us today. Absolutely. And I would have... You, I mean, I forgot to mention that on the slide, but my la- last name, first name at Gmail is my email. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out and just put the subject line as long COVID and I'll be able to get back to you within 24 hours. Great, great. Thank you so much. Absolutely, yeah. I would also like to thank our panelists, Dr. Rajni Pagare, ma'am. Um, I thank our entire Physio TV team, Dr. Ashok Sham, uh, Mr. Rahul Chaube, Dr. Apur Chimpi. Dr. Neera Jathavle, Dr. Manish Rai, and all other members of Physio TV. And lastly, a big thank you to our viewers who have been vital in making this webinar successful. Uh, looking forward to your support in upcoming webinars as well. Uh, this is Dr. Rucha Raya signing off for the day. Thank you once again. Stay safe and have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you.